This video is brought to you by Odds Jam. If you've never heard of arbitrage betting, think of it like the Rob Lowe of betting. You play both sides so that you come out on top. Every sports book has different odds, and through Odd Jam's algorithm, they track the odds of every sports book up to the second to let you know which games to play so that you always come out on top and are guaranteed to make money. As an example, this Sunday, I went to the arbitrage calculator that Odds Jam has and saw that over at Bet365, they had minus 125 odds on the Lions to score over one and a half touchdowns in the first half, while at Hard Rock, they have plus 145 odds on the Lions to score under one and a half touchdowns in the first half. Odds Jam tells you exactly what to bet so that you are guaranteed to make money no matter what happens. Because either the Lions will score multiple touchdowns in the first half, or they won't. No matter what happens in the first half, whether the Lions put up five touchdowns or put up none, I am guaranteed to come out on top. It is that easy. And making it even easier is the fact that you don't even have to manually find these bets. Odds Jim's tool makes everything one click away, and there are hundreds of bets like that every single day based on the sports books available in your area. If you know me, you know that I have a legal background, so I truly mean it when I say that with arbitrage betting and Odds Jim's up to the second calculator, you literally cannot lose and always come out ahead. It's not betting so much as it is math. If you sign up now using my promo code JG9, not only do you get a seven day free trial, and not only does it help the channel out a lot, but you get 25% off your first month. Link in the description down below. So sign up for Odds Jam today, or the odds will be in your favor. When people talk about the greatest announcer boots in the history of Monday Night Football, it usually depends on what era you grew up in. However, the boot that is consistently ranked near the top and is universally loved is the three-man booth with Al Michaels at play-by-play and Frank Gifford and Dan Deardorff on color commentary. It's rare to have a three-man booth work, because it's a lot of voices at the same time. They have to balance that out extremely well without making it seem too crowded. But the Michaels Gifford Deardorff booth was a revelation for ABC. At a time in the mid-80s when Monday Night Football was in an identity crisis after losing Howard Cosell, and when everyone else they tried out, from O.J. Simpson to Joe Namath, failed miserably, and when the program was declining in ratings and was on the verge of getting cancelled by ABC, this three-man booth was usually pretty sharp. They could present the game well, they had wit, they had chemistry, and they had everything you look for in an announcing booth, as they helped bring Monday Night Football back to relevancy. And speaking of bringing things to relevancy, the whole purpose of this channel is to bring back stories that have been lost throughout time in the history of the NFL. So if you like that sort of stuff, and you like learning more about the history of this game, then be sure to hit that like button down below, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell so you don't miss a single video that we post on the channel. We post every single day here about the weird and wacky history of the NFL, so if you like that sort of stuff, then this is the place for you. Thanks in advance for your support as we try and hit 70,000 subscribers. However, not all announcing boots are perfect. Everyone makes mistakes, and everyone is going to have off games. And man, to say that the booth had a bit of an off day during this game right here would be putting it lightly. Because during a 1988 game between the Buffalo Bills and the Miami Dolphins, the announcing booth decided to spend more time talking about the city of one of the teams playing in the game and less about the actual game. With the game being a roast session of Buffalo with a football game going on in the background. And to say that there was outrage over this? Well, when ABC's own local affiliate is feuding with ABC National and Monday Night Football, that's when you know. That's when you really know. Because this is the story by one of the craziest broadcasting controversies in the history of Monday Night Football. Before I talk about the comments in question and how out of line they were to the point where there was considerable outrage, we need some context to understand the importance of the game at hand and how the game was going. It's November 14th, 1988. It's week 11 of the NFL season, and we find ourselves down in Miami for this AFC East rivalry game between the Buffalo Bills and the Miami Dolphins, and two of the top quarterbacks in football in Jim Kelly and Dan Marino, two future Hall of Famers. This game had massive implications for both teams. For the home team, the Dolphins, they entered this one with a 5-5 record, in the middle of an absolute logjam within the conference for one of the wildcard spots. Win this game, 
and you're tied with a whole slew of teams at 6-5, including the Colts, Patriots, Broncos, and Raiders, for the final wildcard spot with five games to go. As for the Bills, they entered this one as the best team in football, sitting pretty with a 9-1 record, and sitting three games up on the division lead. Win this game and go to 10-1, and, and not only do you practically clinch the division with a four-game lead with five to go, but seeing as you'd be two up on the Cincinnati Bengals at 8-3, and three, you'd have a two-game cushion and a pretty good lead on the number one seed in the AFC to get home field advantage throughout the playoffs. Considering the fact that the Super Bowl was going to be in Miami, if you won this game, you'd put yourself in a good spot to come back to this venue in two months. As for how this game went, while the first game was a low-scoring affair that finished with the Bills winning at 9-6, the second one was anything but that, as the Bills put on a clinic. Much like last time, the Dolphins only put up 6 points. However, unlike last time, the Bills put up 31, as they took this one by 25 points. This game was pure and utter domination for Buffalo, and that's an understatement. Whereas the Bills had 29 first downs, moving the ball at will, the Dolphins only had 15, so the Bills had nearly double the number of first downs that the Dolphins had. Whereas the Dolphins had only 33 yards on the ground, the Bills ran for 205 yards, meaning that for every one yard the Dolphins had on the ground, the Bills had 7. Whereas the Dolphins only averaged 2.5 yards per carry, the Bills averaged 4.6, averaging more than 2 yards per carry better. The Bills had 37 minutes of possession compared to just 23 for the Dolphins, and the Bills forced three turnovers while committing none of their own. So if you win the turnover margin by three, you're usually going to do pretty well. And while Jim Kelly was incredibly efficient, going 18 for 26 with 211 yards, a touchdown, no picks, and a passer rating of 106.4, Dan Marino was anything but that, throwing three picks, and posting a passer rating of 57.5, which was one of the lowest ratings of his career at the time. Buffalo never trailed at any point, and thanks to two touchdowns by Ronnie Harmon and two touchdowns by Rob Riddick, this one was a wrap. A lot of people were asleep during the fourth quarter because this one was never in doubt. I'll put it like that. And so, when the game is a blowout, what do the announcers talk about? Obviously, the focus in a close game is on the game itself, but when the game gets out of hand and when individual plays might not matter all that much, you're going to call the game differently. When the backups are in there and the game's over, you're going to talk differently. It gets way more relaxed and way more loose up in the booth, and you're not really providing analysis in between the plays so much as you are just having conversations and practicing your stand-up routine. Whether you agree with that or not is up to you. However, that is extremely common practice with every booth in every sport when it's getting late, and the outcome is not in the slightest bit of doubt. And this booth had called their fair share of four possession or more games that season already. They had a week seven game between the Buffalo Bills and the New York Jets that was 37 to 14. And on Halloween, in a game that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, they called a 55-23 drubbing with the Indianapolis Colts over the Denver Broncos. So they knew the drill by this point. Time for some banter. And maybe, just maybe, the banner went a step too far. Because in front of a national television audience, the three-man booth of Al Michaels, Dan Deardorff, and Frank Gifford just decided to crap on Buffalo as a city. Did you know that Buffalo is cold? Buffalo is super cold, and it's basically uninhabitable in the winter. The fact that the Bills were looking poised to be the number one seed and have the postseason run through there was going to be awful. Buffalo had never hosted a playoff game since the merger, so this was going to be ugly. And for the second half of the contest, it was just tons of quips like that built off of stereotypes that you never heard the booth make with other cold cities like Cleveland or East Rutherford or Washington, D.C., which had more snowfall in 1987, oddly enough, than Buffalo had. At one point in the contest, the men in the booth were talking about the high winds in Buffalo, and they said this. And Al, when you're talking about home home. field advantage in the, in the playoffs, Whoa. that is a huge home field advantage in Buffalo in January. <laughs> Whoa. That's called home field rink. <laughs> uh, what, you talk, uh, what about a home field advantage in November? 
the Bills were talking to us last night about the problems they had just practicing this week up in Buffalo. They had to deal with 60 mile an hour winds. It toppled a light standard at their practice facility. And they told everyone who had uh, their cars on the upper deck of the parking garage to move them off the upper deck because the wind was so bad. Hey, that's early November. That's autumn. On one hand, yeah, 60 mile per hour winds are crazy that early in the year. And that's a pretty noticeable story, especially because a part of their facility was damaged. On the other hand, you do realize that's the exception, not the norm, right? It's not 60 mile per hour winds or higher in Buffalo every single day in January. They made it seem as though when it's January and a playoff game is going to be held there, that it's going to be 90 mile per hour winds if it was 60 in November. And the quips continue, saying that playing in Buffalo in the postseason would be scary because of the weather. Because, once again, it's really cold. You never heard those quips with other cities on a broadcast before, like Chicago or Philadelphia. But with Buffalo, it was apparently fair game. And if I'm an AFC football player, the saying the road to the Super Bowl, Super Bowl goes through Buffalo not only seems like a possibility, but a scary possibility at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if that wasn't enough, at the end of the game, when the Bills won 31-6, the players poured Gatorade on Marv Levy in celebration seeing as the Gatorade shower had become popularized around this time after Bill Parcells with the New York Giants won a Super Bowl. And throughout the entire Gatorade pouring, in a game taking place in Miami, mind you, all the announcers could do was talk about, you guessed it, how cold Buffalo was, and talk about how the city was basically situated in Antarctica. Take a listen. Fell with Kansas City and now Buffalo. <laughs> oh, look at oh, this. Oh, will they? Will they? Oh. They got him. <laughs> he, does, he looks less than happy. I don't think Marv's into it. No. Not yet. But he wouldn't mind a few more of those. Imagine how that would feel in Buffalo in January. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> it would never hit the carpet. <laughs> no way. Bicycles. No way. Marv wouldn't move again until May. This wasn't just one offhand comment or one quip made about the cold weather. This was a constant theme throughout the entire broadcast. Those were just some of the examples. It was like the Charles Barkley ran out San Antonio, minus the part where it's actually funny, but plus the part where it goes on for three hours instead of just a couple of minutes in a studio show. Here the Bills were, winning a football game against their rival and playing lights out and solidifying their spot as the number one seed in the conference for the moment. And all the announcers could do was just talk about how cold the city was and how brutal it is. Which, to say that this did not go over well with Buffalo would be, uh, yeah. Putting it extremely lightly. When I say that there were tons of complaints pouring into ABC about these comments, demanding that Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, and especially Dan Deardorff apologized and paint Buffalo in a positive light, I truly mean it. And do you want to know who these comments were spearheaded by? That's right, Channel 7, as in the local ABC affiliate in Buffalo themselves. ABC was feuding with itself on this. During the news telecast in Buffalo that aired immediately after this, the three anchors there of Irv Weinstein, Mark Cooper, and Mary McCombs actively encouraged their viewers and anyone watching to write letters to ABC to tell them how unacceptable this was and to voice their complaints because of how completely uncalled for these comments were and how unprofessional the broadcast was. Especially because a good chunk of the country had never been to Buffalo before and their only knowledge of Buffalo was the fact that they had the bills, for ABC to perpetuate this stereotype angered a ton of people and made the city look really, really bad for no reason. One person wrote in and said, Every Monday night, thousands of Buffalo Bills fans sit down to watch America's favorite pastime, Monday Night Football. The November 14th episode of Monday Night Football was the most disgraceful imitation of professional broadcasting in the history of Monday Night Football. Throughout the entire game, the Three Stooges lodged a biased attack on both the Buffalo Bills and the great city of Buffalo and western New York. The comment that the road to the Super Bowl going through Buffalo would be horrifying was extremely offensive. Buffalo is a city with heart. The people of western New York have worked too hard to prove to the rest of the country 
that Buffalo is truly a great place to be to have these stooges denounce our city unjustly. We believe that a terrible injustice was inflicted on our bills and the people of Buffalo and Western New York. If ABC has any class at all, a public apology from the Three Stooges will be forthcoming. And the hits just kept on coming. Another person wrote, I could not believe the comments made by the announcers during the Bills Dolphins Monday Night Game. They were commenting more on windy, snowy, cold Buffalo weather than they were about the awesome Buffalo Bills football team. The New England Patriots, Chicago Bears, Pittsburgh Steelers, Cincinnati Bengals, and New England Patriots did not take such criticism about their weather as the Bills have. By the way, Washington DC received more snow last year than Buffalo. Another person wrote, It's obvious that Gifford, Deardorff, and Michaels had not done their homework for the Monday Night Showdown between the Bills and Dolphins. I stopped counting the inaccuracies in the play-by-play -play and tasteless commentary. You get the idea by this point. When it came to this game right here, the fact that the announcers were highlighting the potentially awful Buffalo weather as if it would be like playing a game on the North Pole and were seemingly bashing Buffalo for that was not taken well. The fans were unhappy, the city was not happy, and even ABC's own affiliate was not happy, which is always a really good sign. As for what happened after the game between these two teams by me right here, while the Miami Dolphins would miss the postseason, oddly enough, the Buffalo Bills would not get the number one seed. Yes, they had a two-game lead on the Cincinnati Bengals, but the Bills ended up losing three of their final four games, including a game against none other than the Cincinnati Bengals. So even though the Bills finished with a 12-4 record and won the AFC East, they had to settle for the number two seed, meaning that the postseason ended up going through Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. They ended up meeting in the 1988 AFC Championship, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, even though it didn't finish all that well for Buffalo, because the Bills were so good for the next decade or so, let's just say that Monday Night Football was going to Buffalo a lot over the next decade. And based on the comments made by Michael Skifford and Deardorff, they probably packed 30 or so layers. Some people might view the comments made in the booth by Michaels, Gifford, and Deardorff during this game right here as a massive overreaction, that they had every right to say that Buffalo was cold, and that they had every right to do it during a blowout game. Others might view those comments as disrespectful, as completely out of line, as completely off topic to the game at hand, and as completely hypocritical, seeing as at no point whatsoever did those three men make comments about other cold cities. Whatever your thoughts are on this, it was controversial either way. Because in 1988, as hot as the Buffalo Bills were on this day against the Dolphins, that's how cold the Monday Night Football booth thought the city was going to be come January. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.